Hello, everyone, and a warm welcome also from my side to everyone who is attending this virtual Flink Forward conference. I'm Stefan Yoon, I'm the CTO at Bavarica, and I'm one of the folks that created Apache Flink long ago and now work in the Apache Flink PMC. I'm going to talk to you today a bit about what we're doing to make Apache Flink a good citizen in the cloud native era. Before diving into this, though, I would like to take this opportunity and, um, and extend a thank you to the Flink community as a whole. I had the, yeah, I was lucky enough to be one of the folks that created this project long ago, but where this project is today is really the work of so many amazing and smart people who put their ideas and their passion into this. I wanna say thank you to all of them. I'm standing here and presenting um, a bunch of really cool ideas, but none of those would have been possible without all of you working together on this. So thank you very much to each and every one of you. Over the last months, this community has actually created three big releases since the last time really we, we met at a virtual Flink Forward conference end of last year. And over these releases, there was a lot of really cool, cool stuff that went into Flink, a lot of progress around the unified batch and streaming angle, a lot of progress around streaming SQL, change data capture, materialized view support, um, a lot of progress on Flink for Python users, and a lot of work still on the on the fabric that that powers Flink, the batching and streaming runtimes and network stack, the distributed coordination that holds everything together. So even after all those years, I think Flink is still like with each release becoming almost more and more of a, of a new system. But this community isn't just great at keeping to, to innovate even after, after six, seven years of developing this project. It's also a really good community at, at helping each other and, and supporting users. These are two figures that I took from the annual, annual report of the Apache Software Foundation. And they're almost crazy to look at, if you ask me. So for example, on the left-hand side, you can see that three out of the most active discussion forums, mailing lists really inside the Apache Software Foundation are actually Flink, like Flink developer, Flink user to user, Flink user to user in Chinese language. On the right-hand side, you can see from the big data user mailing lists how big really the Flink community is in terms of the amount of discussion threads and traffic they have. And that is not even talking about things like Stack Overview and other chat groups. So I think that's really a testament to a community that is extremely open and active and eager to help each other. And again, thank you everybody who participates in this. This is amazing. I think this is a big part of why Flink is where it is today. Thank you very much. After, after looking a little bit at, at the efforts of the Flink community in the last months. Let's actually look at some of the things that are happening in the current months. And I would like to focus, like the title indicated, specifically on some of these efforts that we're doing to make Flink a more cloud native system. Why are we actually doing that? Like, what's the point? Isn't cloud native really just a buzzword that you attach to things in order to say like, yeah, cool, you know, if we call it cloud native, then folks will think it's place better with Kubernetes or it's a more modern thing or, or just, you know, it's just an overall marketing term that people have come to attach to things if they want to make it sound modern. That might partially be true, but there's also, I think, something something very graspable here. If you if you look at what what the like common understanding of cloud native is these days, if you look at the definition of the term from the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, for example, there's there's lots of things associated with it but there's a few things that that kind of um, that kind of are a pattern for me and a lot of it is around how do you deploy systems how do you interact with them how do you operate them they're they're kind of standard patterns standard tools standard ways of doing things and by following those ways you make you make the system you know not only play together more naturally with certain infrastructure but you also make it easier for users to really deal with the system because you're following more like standard ways of doing things. And I think this is something that that, that we we can really admittedly improve in Apache Flink. Flink started out as a as a stream processing system, still as a stream processing system. I think it it really 
is one of the of the systems that that grew together with stream processing as a use case and it enabled very many new stream processing use cases as, as one of the yeah one of the systems that pushed the envelope here and it it does pretty amazing things these days like there are many setups by now that actually operate in the order of petabytes per day trillions of events terabytes to hundreds of terabytes of states all managed in flink not offloading that to other databases and and you know just working around that it's really flink is doing the heavy lifting almost in a self-contained system there and that that required to change a bunch of, of things and ideas on how you know how how an application that is, is written against Flink works, but also on that on that way we made we had to make a few choices about you know how to operate the system how to do it that may feel to a lot of folks different from what they're used to, and I think this is basically something where where we can where we can try and and make make it a lot more approachable by looking at some of these patterns that make up cloud native and see how how close can we get actually with a system like flink to that and and making it feel a lot more natural for users to use before diving into exactly what we're doing right now i'd like to take a moment just to review really how cloud native or cloud non-native flink is these days um, I hope you can appreciate the squirrel-shaped cloud I found to illustrate this. Um, when we're looking at how yeah, cloud-native or non-native Flink is these days, let's take actually a moment and a step back and, and look at where Flink, where Flink actually came from and what journey it already took. So Flink was born very much in what some folks call the cluster era. Um, it's the era when Hadoop was big, Spark came up, Yarn was the way most companies deployed things. It was really dominated by, by a design where you bring up a cluster of working demons and then you, you give them work and at some point in time they might tell you the work is done and accept new work or they just keep working on these things forever in case of a long-running application. The way you interacted with those applications was through custom RPC protocols you had to use very specific clients to actually interact with these applications. That was, that was very much Flink as well in its very first versions. But it has come a pretty long way since then. So in, in many ways, streaming applications actually get deployed in, in Flink's application mode, meaning we're no longer really thinking in terms of clusters and, and, and working daemons. The applications and the process, they're, they're really the same thing here in the application mode. Um, everything is exposed now through a single HTTP endpoint, and you can use you can use very many standard clients to interact with Flink. What's really defining, I think, about Flink's both cloud nativeness and also the things where it's not very cloud native is the way it actually handles state. And one thing that's actually pretty nice about this, and it's 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 something that that I think is often overlooked, is the fact that you can actually run stateful jobs, almost like stateless deployments. I mean, stateless, at least in the sense of you wouldn't need stateful sets, for example, to run this on Kubernetes. You wouldn't need a persistent volume. You can kill pretty much all workers at the same time, and you don't have to fear that this actually causes any data loss. If you scale up and down, you don't have to worry about node decommissioning more than one or two nodes at the same time, because you might run in a too low replication factor. Like none of those things are things you have to worry about, which is which is a pretty good property. And I think um, something that a lot of folks have come to appreciate about the way Flink works. The dependencies that Flink has are very simple. The, the strongest dependency is on an object store or distributed file system to snapshot your state to. And other than that, it's really these days something as simple as a config map if you're deploying on Kubernetes, just so that that job managers and task managers can register themselves and, and find each other. A little bit of a Flink-specific service discovery and, and checkpoint metadata entry point. And something that's also very interesting, I think, is with the simple dependency on just an object store. On most cloud providers, you actually get, get a durability across availability zones out of the box because um, the object stores or the file systems, they're actually durable for region, not just a single data center. So you actually get this at least availability zone failover 
um, without paying for additional traffic or without having to do additional things to make data durable across a single zone. All those are, I think, very nice properties, very much, um, very much good properties in the, in the cloud native game and very much properties that I think we're looking to preserve. But there are, of course, a bunch of other things that um, where just the design of Link is, is a bit different than, than what, um, what you expect from at least common stateless applications, also from databases, because Flink really sits kind of in the middle. It's, it's a stateful application running almost in pretending to be a stateless application. So it's running on, on nodes that you can arbitrarily lose and it does all, it keeps all its ground truth state really in, in, in an object or in a distributed file system. And the only things it keeps locally are ephemeral working copies and state indexes. That design that defines so many properties, both in a good and in a, in a way that you have to get used to it, I think is something that, 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 that we will see. We, um, there, there are a lot of things we, like how we can evolve this to actually keep a many of the good properties and actually make it more easily accessible to many users. So in the following here are four initiatives that are currently going on between several Flink committers um, to make really Flink more cloud native, change its cloud native nature. Let's start with the first one, which is maybe the smallest, but not to be underrated at all. It's basically working on better operational APIs. So while, while Flink has consolidated the operational APIs around an HTTP endpoint and a RESTful style of interacting with, um, with Flink and its applications, there are, there are a few things that we aim to improve here. And these are really for everybody who whoever tried to write a Flink operator or deployment scripts and has wondered, you know, if I actually make a call to trigger a save point, um, and, and now I have to retry the, the call to actually, you know, to actually accidentally trigger a second save point or what's going to happen. I canceled a job and the, the whole thing went away, but was the job really canceled or is there still something lingering? We want to make all these, these situations just much easier for you to, to understand and handle when you interact with Flink. That's the first initiative. You can expect a bunch of things to come up in Flink 115 there. The second one, which is one of the biggest ones, is something that has actually been going on for, I would say, at least a year by now. Um, small steps, but important steps, and we are, we're still going further here. It's about predictable and fast checkpoint times, or as I sometimes call it, snappier shots. Let me take a, uh, let me briefly bring back the picture from a few, few slides back about this like very fundamental aspect of Flink's architecture, having this pipeline of events and then asynchronous snapshots to a different tier. The two things folks really need to worry about when they run a Flink application is first of all, events actually flow through the pipeline, end up in the sync, and it's not something where let's say the sync is currently blocked, cannot accept anything or something ends up being so CPU heavy or there's so much data skew that individual nodes get overwhelmed. That, that's something you need to, you need to look at. Um, the thing you shouldn't actually worry about as much as you need to do now is whether snapshots make progress. That's the other thing. If snapshots are well behaved. You're, you're in a good situation. If they're not well behaved, you may want to look into this. Very often it's not a problem, but then sometimes it is. So how do you know? So the thing we really want to do here is get to a point where snapshots become so much easier and predictable that you basically don't have to worry about them anymore. And the, the, the thing we want to bring with this initiative here is really predictably fast checkpoint times. Like think checkpoints run something every two to five seconds and they always run like this. No matter if a heavy window is firing, no matter whether RocksDB is starting some heavy compaction in the background, no matter if you're hitting back pressure or not. So the two things we really worry about here is checkpoints being delayed by in-flight data and checkpoints being delayed by just heavy state snapshots. To avoid checkpoints being delayed by heavy data, there's two things we can do. Just having less in-flight data in the first place and not being blocked by in-flight data. To have less data in flight, that's where the new buffer debloating feature from Flink 114 can help you. Not being blocked by in-flight data is something we already added to Flink 
in the previous releases. Starting with Flink 112, unaligned checkpoints are available and you can use them to actually create checkpoints that are not blocked by in-flight data, albeit at a slightly added cost of persisting that in-flight data, which is again where buffer debloating helps to just vastly reduce that amount of in-flight data. And in order to have checkpoints not delayed by large state snapshots, this is where we're trying to extend the existing incremental checkpoints to something called generalized log-based incremental checkpoints. Then we quickly say a few words about buffer debloating here, which I think is a, is a setting I would expect most Flink users will want to activate. It's currently because it's the first released version, not active by default. The idea is actually really simple behind it. The idea is that we go away from a classic scheme of buffering a fixed amount of in-flight data between a sender and a receiver to buffering data that is relative to the current throughput of the receiver. The current fixed buffering of Flink is really tailored towards what fast networks these days need to be, to, to be able to saturate them. And it often enough is just way more than you need because the receiving operators might not actually be able to receive data as fast as the network can deliver it um, because maybe they're currently under back pressure or maybe they're doing something extremely CPU intensive and they just need a, a little bit processing time on each record. And buffer debloating continuously measures that throughput of the receiver and adjusts the buffering capacity. The effect of that's actually really impressive. This is one of our one of our initial um, results here, and let's really compare the leftmost and the rightmost bars here, because the leftmost is what you get in Flink without buffer debloating, the rightmost with activated buffer debloating in default settings. You can see that even a job with five network shuffles under full back pressure will actually pipe everything through the topology in less than five seconds. So the target of saying we never buffer more than a receiver can process within one second seems to be pretty well achievable by this mechanism. If you translate that to using buffer deep loading together with unaligned checkpoints, then instead of that being the time reduction in, in taking a checkpoint, that's actually the reduction in in-flight data that you have to store in the checkpoint. It's also pretty neat. Let's quickly take a look at what generalized incremental checkpoints is about. This is about really decoupling the work that happens in a checkpoint from the, from the work of actually persisting the state. What currently is done in a checkpoint are all the changes that the state backend had, that, this, that occurred in the state backend since the last checkpoint. So if you're, for example, using RocksDB and RocksDB had a heavy compaction going on and, and just spit out a large file, even though maybe you changed only three events, then in the next checkpoint, you'll have to include that large file or rather Flink will include that large file for you in the next checkpoint. That can actually mean that a checkpoint takes very long, even though you didn't really change very much data since the last checkpoint. With the generalized incremental checkpoints, we're decoupling this, that within a checkpoint, the only thing we do is really change, exa persist exactly the difference to the last checkpoint. And then there is a continuous background process that actually persists the chunks that the state backend produces. So if RocksDB produces a big file during a compaction, then this gets uploaded in the background. And these eventually replace the state diffs. So it's really more or less working as a distributed version of a, of, of a database here, or like a distributed version of RocksDB itself. On the checkpoint, what you do is persist something like a writer headlock only, and then periodically in the background, you persist the compact version of the state that is optimized for faster access. But where the durability of that version, it doesn't matter if it, if it lingers behind by a few seconds. Let's talk about elasticity. I think elasticity is something that comes up pretty quickly when, when folks mention the term cloud native. And there's quite a bit happening in the, in the area uh, of, of Flink management deployment when it comes to elasticity. The first one I want to mention here is the new reactive scaling mode that came with Flink 113, so already the previous version. To explain what this is about, let's actually take a look at the two previous uh, deployment modes that you could, could choose from in Flink. There's the standalone application mode, um, I also often call it the passive mode, where if you use to run Flink in standalone mode on Kubernetes, then Flink doesn't know it runs on Kubernetes. It just has resources that it works with. 
Flink would define the parallelism of a pipeline, and then you need to make sure that when you deploy it, you actually provide enough task managers to actually be able to run this application. So it's kind of a, a bit of an explicit thing to keep in sync, the configuration of Flink and the number of resources you provide. There's another mode called the native Kubernetes application mode, which I also call the, the active deployment mode. In this case, Flink knows very well that it runs on Kubernetes and constantly talks to Kubernetes to bring up and tear down resources. You would define the parallelism for a Flink application or even different parallelism for different operators. And then the Flink scheduler would talk to Kubernetes to bring up the right amount of resources. And even with you know, fine-grained resource profiles as they're currently supported in Flink, you can even um, release and acquire and release resources in a, in a very fine-grained level, possibly with additional dependencies on resources like GPUs and so on. It's really, it's really quite powerful and flexible. But it's, it's a very Flink-specific thing again, right? It's not, it's, not a very, it's not the same way as you operate with any other application. So it's a good mode, I think, for power users and for, um, for a lot of platform deployments. But it's not the simplest one to get started with. The new reactive mode kind of sits in the middle between the two. What it does is it lets actually Flink react to external resource changes. So let's say we have a deployment here, two Flink task managers and two pods again on Kubernetes. The task managers don't know that they actually run on Kubernetes. In that sense, it's very similar to the standalone passive mode. Flink just runs on these resources like on any other resource. If you actually bring up a new pod with a new task manager, the scheduler will notice that there are more resources available and actually will scale out the job for you. And similarly, if you remove resources, it will scale in the job for you. So in many ways, the job actually reacts to external resource changes. In the long run, I believe this will actually replace the passive mode. So we'll we'll be having active and reactive modes of deployment. Again, the active modes being interesting for more managed platform deployments, the reactive one probably being the mode for, for, for everyone that wants to just treat Flink like any other application. Define some metrics, create a horizontal pod autoscaler around it, and just let it fly. Elasticity is also very much defined by the time it takes to change the parallelism. And this is something where we're also doing a bunch of work in Flink. Let's actually take a look what that means at the example of going from a job with three tasks to, to rescaling it to four tasks. If you're running it as three tasks, these three tasks will actually run three embedded RocksDB instances and basically create their own tables that have a, a range slice out of the total space of data and keys that are processed by the pipeline. And if we go from three to four, we'll have to repartition this. Um, Flink will split up the key group ranges differently, assign them to, to four tasks. And it will, yeah, the different, the different databases that were created by the three tasks, the embedded RocksDB instances, now have to be merged to become four RocksDB instances, split and merged actually, um, so that the four tasks can work on them. And this is something that's done eagerly during recovery with a different parallelism right now. But it, it really wouldn't have to be done eagerly. That's the interesting observation. It can be done very much lazily because the beauty of stream processing is that all the different tasks are working on disjoint pieces of the data. So here's some, here's some um, experiments we're doing. It's, um, it's currently still a, a prototype. It's not yet on the roadmap to be merged but it has some very promising results in order to speed up the rescaling behavior. Here at the example of rescaling a 122 gigabyte snapshot from three tasks to four tasks. You can see for comparison, if you don't rescale, uh, things work comparatively fast, just has to pull the state from the checkpoint storage. And if you rescale in Flink 114, it takes longer. You have to pull the databases to, that you need to split and merge that are relevant for the recovered state of a certain task. And then you need to do this whole rescaling procedure on, on the task. We actually merge two RocksDB instances. And that takes a long time, but it doesn't have to take as long as that. Um, there are different versions of the prototype that incrementally improve things like the first version um, improves discarding 
data that is irrelevant. So we don't have to keep carrying it um, forward through the checkpoints, even though it wouldn't hurt. It would just make the checkpoints much larger than they need to be. The next prototype makes the merging of the different key group ranges that that um, that come from different original tasks into the least get tasks faster. There's a final version that is very experimental because it needs some changes in RocksDB, but where yeah, where we're investigating um, what are feasible approaches to work with that because. There's really some potential to make rescaling not much more expensive than actual recovery, which would be something pretty amazing, I think, for the whole operational characteristics of Flink. Let's look at the final um, initiative. How can we achieve faster failover in general? And with faster failover, I'm, I'm really looking at, at having very, very large state recovered into crashed task manager with very little delay so that even very large stateful jobs don't have to fear um, rolling the Docker images for security patches very frequently, or even moving them to different machines if the underlying VMs have to be um, rolled for security patches. Fast failover, fast recovery for stateful application, very often the first thing um, the first thing that comes up is, yeah, you, you have to, to disaggregate it, disaggregate it differently. So Flink is in some sense a disaggregated system, but in a very special way. The durable state is in a very is in a different tier, but in order to actually work, Flink needs its working copies, its state indexes to actually work on. Those are the local embedded RocksDB instances um, being instantiated, being worked on in, with, in memory and by compaction threads. The, the durable copy of these RocksDB instances rests in an S3 or an HDFS or ORSS. Now, of course, we can change this and, and, and say, hey, let's just work with a remote database. Instead of having embedded RocksDB instances, we basically use some database, some remote database, be that a managed one on a cloud provider or, um, or just, yeah, when every time you deploy a Flink application, you also deploy that database. And that, that in fact, actually makes the Flink application itself a lot more lightweight um, because now all of the durable state and the working copies, they're just the same. They're just sitting in the remote database. And it's definitely an interesting setup, and I think it might be a good match for one or the other for one or the other user. It does lose a few very interesting properties, namely the fact that you can deploy a Flink application right away without having to also provision capacity for that remote database. That's something I really liked about Flink. You you throw a new application onto the cluster. You don't have to first, for example, talk to the team that manages your Kafka brokers and ensure that there is enough capacity that you can, you know, create a lot of very heavy traffic intermediate topics. Um, you just deploy the application because it doesn't really hit any other system other than your object store or DFS, which are usually, if those aren't the most scalable systems um, in that that are available. In, in, a, in a cloud or on, on on-prem, then, yeah, then then I think we have an, an issue anyways. The other thing is that with a remote database, you really lose some of these nice snapshot operations abilities that Flink has, the ability to create immutable snapshots as backups, save points, and so on. So there's a different way that's actually coming as a fairly low-hanging fruit if we look at some of the developments, especially with, uh, with cloud providers right now, and that is, just a better way to use remote disks. And many, many data centers, we can actually see that the standard volumes that they're suggesting for VMs are actually, actually remote block store devices, be that EBS, persistent disks, virtual disks or so, and the different cloud providers. And, and by just changing a little bit how Flink, how Flink works, we can actually make, make Flink exploit those very well. We don't change the fundamental characteristic that and the immutable snapshot, the primary copy relies still on the object store. It is there, it is, it is safe, it's safe for recovery across availability zones and so on. But instead of having to rebuild the working copy and in the index after a task manager failed over, it just remounts it and, and rewinds it to the last consistent state. Let's actually see how that looks in action. Let's take a look at the effect of using persistent volumes for failover recovery. For that, we're taking a very simple demo streaming job consisting of two operators. One is a source that pushes event at a fast rate and the other one is a stateful streaming transformation. 
The setup here for this demo is rather simple. We have a small parallelism of eight. We're running on four task managers and the stateful streaming transformation is creating state in the order of some gigabytes per task manager. So we can expect reasonable failover times even without persistent volume recovery. The whole setup is running on a Kubernetes cluster on Google Cloud. We can see here we have four pods for task managers, one pod for job manager that coordinates the execution. For well, the first part of this demo, we'll actually take a look at what failover looks like without persistent volume support enabled. So we have the persistent volume recovery disabled here. And failover means that Flink will have to go to the checkpoint storage to retrieve state for failed task managers in all cases. Let's take a look what happens when we kill a task manager. To kill a task manager, we're telling Kubernetes to delete one of the pods. After it deleted the pod, it will automatically bring up a replacement pod for that task manager. We can see the new pod is getting created. We can see Flink saw that the application failed. It lost contact with the task manager that we killed and it started the restarting phase. We should see the new task manager coming up soon. Here it is, which also means we should see the job actually entering the running state again. The stateful transformation spent some time in the initialization phase before switching to running. The initialization phase is the phase in which it downloads the state. If we take a look at the timeline in detail here for, for that stateful streaming operation after the failover, we can, we can see that for all task managers, where we didn't kill the pods, where the task manager process survived and the pod survived, the failover was extremely fast. Like all the phases, from created scheduling, deploying, initializing to running takes less than a second, which makes sense because all that the tasks on these nodes really do is basically a local rollback to the latest committed checkpoint. For the tasks on the task manager where we killed the pod, it looks quite different because with the pod being lost and the task manager being lost, the local state, state snapshots get lost. So those tasks will have to recover from the checkpoint storage. And that takes a longer time. We can actually see here is an initial time where it recaches Java files and deployment descriptors, takes about a second. And then we can see around about 10 seconds for the time to pull back the state from checkpoint storage and rebuild the local RocksDB instance. Now let's see in comparison how that looks actually if we enable persistent volume support for recovering. We're running the same job again now with the same configuration, same parallelism, same state size, same checkpoint size. We're running it on the same cluster as before with the four task managers and one job manager, but we updated the configuration of that cluster to enable persistent volume recovery and restarted the pods. Now let's see what the impact of that setting is for um, for failure recovery from a lost task manager. So like before, we're going to kill one task manager by deleting the pod. We're going to kill the exact same task manager again, task manager one, deleting the pod. And as before, when we delete the pod, Kubernetes will bring up a replacement pod, mount the persistent volume, the new task manager will register with the Flink job manager and it will be able to recover from the local volume. So Flink should have noticed that the task manager is lost. It should have discovered the new task manager by now, and it will trigger the failover procedure and bring the job back into running state. Now let's look at the timeline here and see what the difference is compared to the failover behavior before. And we can see that this looks already quite a bit different. Again, all the failures on other task managers recover almost instantaneously, right? We can see all these phases, scheduling, deploying, deploying initializing, they're basically running sub-second and the task is back at processing events. The two tasks that were running on task manager one, they look quite a bit different. 
they still need to go through the deploying phase where uh, the task is caching jar files and deployment descriptors and so on. It's something we haven't optimized with persistent volume recovery. But the noticeable thing is here that the state recovery itself takes less than a second now. It used to be 10 seconds without persistent volumes. So here we can clearly see that this is very different. It's not downloading gigabytes anymore from the checkpoint storage. It's basically just reattaching the disks and continuing on a consistent snapshot from the local volumes. It's worth pointing out that this is actually independent of the state size. So while recovery from the checkpoint storage will take longer, the more your state grows, the recovery with persistent volumes is constant time. The second that it takes to recover here is basically recreating local structures, manifests, and relinking files. Then the system is set to continue. And with that, I would like to conclude this presentation. I hope I could get you excited about some of the things we're doing in Apache Flink right now. It's one of the, of the many initiatives we have right now, um, the one about making Flink more cloud native. And I'm very eager to hear what you think about the parts we've already built, what you think about the parts we're currently building, um, any feedback. Yeah, and with that, what the only thing I'm left with to say is enjoy Flink Forward. Thank you for being here. I hope you have a very nice conference. Bye-bye.